Hey guys, all right, today we are going to be watching 2001, The Invasion of Afghanistan, Animated History by Armchair Historian. Um, now, I am a Anglo-Saxon historian, so my knowledge on modern history is not that good. Now, of course, this is definitely history that I have lived through. I was born in 1998. That is correct. I am 22. Fuck, I'm old. I feel old. I know a lot of you are probably going to comment, you're not old, you fucker. I'm I'm 33 or some fucking shit. I don't know. But I feel old. Let me let me have this. Um I do not remember 9/11. I was trying to do the math. I was like 2 years old. I wasn't 3 yet. I don't think because I was born towards the end of 1998. Yeah, I was two. I was still two. <clears throat> I had to do the math. I don't know why I had to think so hard on the math there. But, uh, yeah. So, Afghanistan is tricky because not all of the information is known. And it certainly still isn't all known yet. Like, I think there was a leak of called the Afghanistan Papers like a year or two ago. Pretty much detailing that the war in Afghanistan is essentially just the war in Vietnam where the United States says it makes it's making progress, but it's really not. Um, now, of course, in the early days, I believe the United States was winning, right? Al-Qaeda was pretty much gone. However, the issue with Afghanistan and kind of uh, some of the some of the Middle Eastern countries is that the way they are governed. Afghanistan is very mountainous. Its people are set up in like tribal villages, right? Like, the, the country's government does not really control the country. It's local leaders that control certain areas. So, you know, it's not a really unified country. Now, it sort of was unified under Al-Qaeda, but I believe because of those tribal villages and how those work is that there would be rivalries between, like, various tribal villages who were a part of al-qaeda right so there'd be a little bit of infighting not much but a little bit um but uh yeah essentially it's like you're not going to be able to successfully govern and prevent al-qaeda from retaining control of afghanistan until you set up a proper infrastructure and way of spreading information and without that Afghanistan is never going to be uh, not going to have a central, a powerful central centralized government. That's never going to happen unless you set up the infrastructure and proper ways of communication throughout the entire country um, because of just how the terrain is set up in Afghanistan. So uh, at least that's, that's my take on it. Um, of course, I could be wrong. I do not know much about the geopolitical stuff of afghanistan so uh yeah anyways we're gonna, gonna go ahead and uh hear hear about this i'm kind of curious what this is going to be about if this is just going to be more about the politics of it or if this is just going to be about the ground fighting of afghanistan the invasion On the frigid slopes of Takhargar in southern afghanistan a team of navy seals are engaged in combat as they struggle to make progress through the knee-deep snow, Taliban and Al-Qaeda insurgents open fire on them with rifles and machine guns. Ooh, this animation with is good. most of the SEAL team already pinned down, Master Sergeant John A. Chapman Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah, he gets the Medal of Honor. ...up the slopes and drawing fire away from his comrades. Encountering an enemy bunker, he eliminates the occupants in a deadly close quarters firefight. Even as the SEAL team leader pushes up the mountain to assist him, Chapman emerges from the bunker and engages the second enemy position, sustaining several direct hits in the process. Although he will succumb to his wounds before medical help can arrive, his heroic actions saves the lives of his squad mates, earning him a posthumous Medal of Honor. Now, why was that important to the story of the invasion? 
Because that was 2002. The Sacrifice of John A. Chapman was just one more name. Ooh, is this a camera upgrade? I think there was a camera upgrade here, Mr. 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 Armchair Historian. This looks more crisp and clean. I like. On that infamous day, four planes were seized by members of Al-Qaeda. While one was diverted from its target by the heroic efforts of its passengers, the other three would go on to strike Why can't the Pentagon my beard look and like the that? World Trade Center. Inflicting I can't get nearly 3,000 casualties it always the worst messy. terror attack to ever occur on U.S. soil. Patchy. But even as rescue teams began picking through the rubble, a cry for vengeance went I out, grow resounding beard. across <laughs> the wounded nation. No matter who was responsible, I'm not that a real historian until I grow a beard. <laughs> From the start, U.S. intelligence operatives had one chief suspect in mind, Osama bin Laden, head of Al-Qaeda and former member of one of the wealthiest six, families four to in six, Saudi six. Arabia. God damn, was he bin really Laden that tall? Was already a suspect in the bombings God of two U.S. Damn, embassies tall man. in East Africa, and the Clinton administration had made several efforts to apprehend or assassinate him in 1998 wow. and 1999. They are providing a lot of information on screen bin Laden here. Was a wily this opponent, is very nice, I like it. Capable of escaping from any trap. But with the international spotlight now firmly on Al-Qaeda's activities after the 9-11 attacks, pressure began to mount on their primary supporters in the Middle East, the Taliban. While the U.S. was still mourning its dead, President George W. Bush issued a stirring ultimatum to the Taliban, who were the de facto rulers of Afghanistan. His message was clear and succinct. Expel Al-Qaeda and turn over bin Laden, or we yeah, will smash uh, your uh, illegal regime. To someone's going to point it out because they decided not to watch un until this point uh, because of what I said at the beginning where I said Al-Qaeda controlled Afghanistan. <laughs> I messed up. Taliban controlled Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda was, was a smaller part inside of the Taliban. It's complicated. I'm going to make mistakes, and like I said, I don't study this area of the world at all. So, yeah, and I haven't taken a modern history course on the Middle East because I don't think there is one available at my university. So, yeah, I, I messed up. And I didn't. him oopsie. out of the rubble ourselves. The Taliban stubbornly refused, and so the stage was, that was a for yet another bloody conflict in the Middle East. But before we discuss the 2001 invasion, God, let's take out a few minutes to establish some context. Historically speaking, Afghanistan has been one of the most tumultuous and unstable Fourteen different ethnic groups live in Afghanistan, with the three Isolated largest being the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, and the Uzbeks. Of the Hindu Uzbeks. Kush. It remained a land of nomadic cattle farmers and tribal fiefdoms well into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Any real developments in modern infrastructure were rudely interrupted by the 1978 Communist Revolution, which led to a Soviet invasion one year later. As the God damn it, Russia. of the ongoing Cold War, Afghanistan received immediate attention from a plethora of state actors, including the United States, Saudi Arabia, and most importantly, Pakistan. Pakistan. Ever since it gained independence in 1947, Pakistan has had good reason God, he says to meddle like in American, Afghanistan's yeah. affairs. Much as Germany Pakistan. in the 19th century devoted its diplomatic efforts to prevent an alliance between France... I think, I think the proper pronunciation, I can't remember. <laughs> I have a Pakistani friend from childhood, and he told me how to pronounce it a long time ago, back in high school. So a very long time ago, a few years ago. And I believe he said it's pronounced Pakistan in, in English. Like that's how you're supposed to pronounce it. Pa, pa, Pakistan, not Pakistan. Pakistan. Now that I keep saying it, I'm questioning myself, and I'm not sure. I think it's Pakistan. If anyone here is who 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 knows how to say words right, tell me if I'm right or wrong, <laughs> please. And Russia, I hope I'm right. Pakistan has invested Otherwise, I'm going to sound like an idiot. Time and resources into preventing Afghanistan from establishing ties with India. Such a union would isolate Pakistan, leaving it vulnerable economically and militarily. During the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Pakistani Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, or ISI, anonymously funneled money and equipment from the CIA and Saudi Arabia to guerrilla forces in Afghanistan. 
The largest of these forces was the Mujahideen, a diverse group of tribal warlords and jihadists with little in common besides the shared goal of driving out their foreign occupiers. Using Afghanistan's mountainous terrain to their advantage, the Mujahideen Osama bin Laden supported the Mujahideen at this time and used his family fortune to transfer military equipment purchased in Saudi Arabia to Afghanistan. When the Soviet Union was forced oh. to pull out of the country in 1989, it led to the total collapse of the not-so-democratic Republic of Afghanistan just three years later. It was during this period that the Taliban first came to prominence. Consisting of ethnic Pashtun students from traditional Islamic schools, the Taliban initially of the seemed Islamic a schools, preferable alternative to the Mujahideen, who are now busy fighting called. amongst themselves. I Taking can't remember. I took an Islamic history course, and I'm already forgetting that information. Stage. They captured the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, and set up the Islamic God, their animation of style Afghanistan. Has this oppressive totalitarian so government over would be years. officially recognized only by Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and of course, Pakistan. Under the new regime, Afghanistan quickly became a safe haven for terrorists, drug traffickers, and slavery. Mm, poppy. Runs. By 1999, the no, country um, was exporting at least 4,000 tons uh, of opium poppy. Yeah, it was poppy. Okay, opium. Of the, the Taliban recently banned opium production in 2000, declared unholy. Conveniently, they also had the largest stockpiles of refined opium in the world. At that point, it made vast profits selling it during the ensuing supply uh, shortage. This was often the sole source of income for Afghan villages, ensuring that support for the Taliban would continue despite their brutal interpretation of Sharia law. This made the country a perfect hiding place for Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Of course, by 2001, the United States was no stranger to combat operations in the Middle East. During the Gulf War, nope. U.S. forces had smashed Saddam Hussein's forces, despite the dictator possessing the fourth largest standing army in the world. Just because it's Indeed, large doesn't mean it's good. However, presented challenges not seen that since could, Vietnam. No one, no one take that out of context, please. The U.S. a decentralized guerrilla force, many of whom were veterans of the Soviet-Afghan war. While Saddam had arrogantly attempted to match the U.S. gun for gun, the Taliban could simply retreat into their mountain strongholds and wait yeah, for the Yeah, it worked for Vietnam. It's going to work for the Afghanistan. The key uh, to a successful invasion was to cut off the Taliban from support in the Middle East. That meant dealing with Pakistan, whose inter-service intelligence agency had been a staunch ally of the Taliban since their inception. The U.S. laid down a simple ultimatum. Pakistan was either against the <laughs> Taliban or against America. When the leader of the ISI implored Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage to consider the complex history of the situation, Armitage simply replied, no, the history begins today. Pakistan Fucking big formally dick. renounced its support for the Taliban on the 15th of September, just four days after 9-11. The next step was to establish I love contact that little eagle with the that they did where it just swoops in. The Taliban left in Afghanistan, the Northern Alliance. Operating out of the remote Panjshir Valley, the Northern Alliance was chiefly composed of former Mujahideen who had agreed to set aside their differences and present a united front against their enemies. On September 26th, an eight-man team of CIA agents operating under the codename Jawbreaker arrived in the Panjshir Valley. Their purpose was to secure the cooperation of the Northern Alliance. Nice. A task made considerably easier by the three million dollars <laughs> in cash they had brought with them. Th that Jawbreaker helps. was then joined by Task Force Dagger, which began providing equipment and training to the Alliance militia. Ten days later, the U.S.-led coalition of nations launched an aerial bombing campaign. Taliban fighters all across the country had their morning prayer routines rudely interrupted by thousands of pounds of U.S. ordnance, raining down on air bases and military infrastructure. Within 24 hours, the Taliban's air defense network was obliterated, and ground forces were clear to move in. The coalition was made up of men from Command several of the invasion nations, was given to U.S. General Tommy United Franks, States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Australia. and New Zealand. But at the start, only the U.S. and the U.K. were directly involved. Additionally, special forces units from dozens of countries were involved in the invasion. The first special forces squads were inserted into the Panjshir Valley via the same route taken by the Jawbreaker team. There, they met with the overall commander of the Northern Alliance, 
Fahim Khan and began a long and arduous trek through the mountains to the Taliban God, controlled city I love their style that they're going with this. God. Simultaneously, I want them to keep the style for like all of their videos. Of US Army Rangers airdropped onto an airstrip southwest of Kandahar. Thanks to skirmishes with the Northern Alliance closer to the city, only a single unfortunate Taliban soldier had been left <laughs> as guard. <laughs> with Poor that airstrip man. secured as a oh, forward God. operating base for later operations, the assault on Mazar-e-Sharif began on the 9th of November. The Taliban had entrenched around the city, but their fortifications only prolonged the inevitable. After the U.S. Air Force spent a few days bombarding the defenders, 2,000 Northern Alliance fighters, led by General Abdul Rashid Dostum, stormed the city to mop up any remaining resistance. After a battle that lasted only 90 minutes, 700 Taliban fighters had been killed or captured. Damn. The Northern Alliance suffered fewer than 50 casualties. Damn. The fall of mazar e sharif came as a major shock to both the Taliban and U.S. Central Command. Both parties had assumed the city would resist for months and require a long period of brutal street fighting to liberate. But now, the road to Kabul lay wide open, and the Northern Alliance wasted no time advancing south towards the capital. To their astonishment, the Taliban offered no resistance, and Kabul fell only three days later. This pattern continued for several weeks, Conventional resistance was all but pointless. U.S. air power was absolute, and moving in the open was a death sentence. The largest battle fought during this period was at the city of Kunduz, where 5,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda soldiers were besieged by coalition forces for 12 days. During this time, the 75th Ranger Regiment conducted assaults on Taliban camps in the mountains around Kandahar. America was sending a strong message. Their forces could be anywhere. Ooh, they got some music time, playing. No warning. There was nowhere to hide. However, despite all progress, things were about to take an abrupt turn for the worse. On November 25th, a prisoner revolt broke out at Kala e Jangi near Mazar e Sharif. Over 600 Taliban and Al Qaeda POWs seized the fortress and its armory which included heavy weapons, such as machine guns and rocket launchers. That's not good. Although the revolt was eventually crushed, the body of CIA agent Johnny Michael Spann was recovered from the rubble. Aww. He was the first American killed in Afghanistan as a result of direct combat. Meanwhile, that, the siege it took that long for the first the Taliban American casualty? Mass. However, many of their leaders well, were mysteriously absent when the city fell. It is suspected that they were airlifted out of the city by the ISI shortly before it fell. This incident, known as the Airlift of Evil, is one of the most controversial of the whole war and symbolic of the complicated political game being played out in the background of the invasion. Speaking of politics, November's operations saw the rise of Hamid Karzai, future president of Afghanistan. Using a small guerrilla force backed up by coalition troops and air support, Karzai liberated the town of Terenkot on the 15th and defended it against a Taliban counterattack. Local militia then flocked to Karzai's banner, swelling his ranks to over 800 men. On December 6th, Kandahar, the Taliban's last major stronghold in Afghanistan, came under siege. The city had already been the target of coalition bombing campaigns and had been hit by a wide variety of ordnance, including Tomahawk cruise missiles. Boom. Now surrounded on all sides, the defenders decided that negotiation might actually be preferable to death after all. In the end, the biggest obstacle U.S. forces faced was a friendly fire incident that saw a bomb dropped near Hamid Karzai's position, lightly wounding him and killing three American soldiers. Despite this, negotiations were successful, and Kandahar surrendered on the 7th. With this victory secure, Hamid Karzai became Afghanistan's new president, which marked the end of the Taliban regime, although there was no sign of Osama bin Laden or most of Al-Qaeda's leadership. U.S. intelligence speculated that they fled to Jalalabad, and the coalition was pinpointed within just 30 feet but after he spent a few seconds too long talking on his radio. One location everyone had hoped to avoid, the infamous White Mountain Cave Network known as Tora Bora. Not wishing to repeat Soviet mistakes, coalition leaders decided to rely on local Afghan troops for the assault. Using money provided by the CIA, they recruited 3,000 militia, 
and sent an army special forces team, I thought Operation they just Detachment Alpha 572, to advise and support them. Initially, things seemed to be going well. The militia were able to take the mountain slopes, and airstrikes were called on every insurgent, suspected insurgent, or suspicious yeah, patch of grass in the area. Fighting in the caves proved harder, and the Afghan militia was not as well suited to the task as their CIA handlers had assumed. In fact, the militia leader was persuaded to open negotiations with the terrorists. During the brief ceasefire that ensued, most of Al-Qaeda's leaders, likely including bin Laden, escaped into Pakistan. Although deeply frustrated by their failure to capture the primary objective of the invasion, coalition leaders tried to remain positive. Afghanistan was now nominally free from Taliban rule, and the democratic process seemed to have resumed. Aid workers and relief supplies were pouring in, and it had cost the West fewer than a hundred casualties. Unfortunately for America, the highly controversial occupation had just begun. In February of 2002, a U.S. intelligence analyst identified what was presumed to be a force of around 300 Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters moving into the Shah Ikat Valley. In response, the U.S. airlifted 2,000 Special Forces soldiers into the area, where they were joined by 1,000 Afghan militia. Operation That's a lot of Special Anaconda Forces. began on March 2nd and would quickly become known as an unmitigated disaster. From the moment they touched down, the American forces found themselves in a Taliban kill zone. The insurgents were heavily armed, and the Apache gunships that were supposed to provide air support found themselves under concentrated fire from rocket launchers and anti-materiel rifles. Two Chinook helicopters were shot down, and mortars bombarded U.S. positions. The Afghan militia, meanwhile, blundered around the valley in brightly colored trucks with headlights. Jingle trucks were painted with elaborate flower patterns and often with chains hanging off their bumpers. Not a very, no, not at all. Blazing, making perfect targets for Taliban mortars. Wow. Although numerical superiority, training, and air support eventually turned the tide in America's favor, Operation Anaconda demonstrated key weaknesses in both their tactics and coordination with local forces. Even after the valley was cleared, a mere 23 Taliban bodies were found. The exact number present in the valley has never been verified, but it is thought that there were at least 600 or more initially suspected and most likely escaped over the border when the tide of battle turned. Eight U.S. soldiers were killed and dozens more wounded. The Fyrick victory of Operation Anaconda set the tone for U.S. operations in Afghanistan for the next decade. The start of the Iraq War in 2003 also diverted resources from the region, leaving the new UN-sanctioned government all but powerless beyond the capital city of Kabul. Most importantly, Osama bin Laden remained at large, his whereabouts unknown and his debt to the American people still outstanding. The manhunt for the notorious leader of Al-Qaeda would continue long after news from Afghanistan stopped making headlines. We'll be covering the end of that manhunt next week with our video titled Operation Neptune Spear. As the U.S. prepared for the invasion of Afghanistan, data security was a top priority. Even a small, seemingly insequential leak might have provided the enemy with key insight into the American battle plan. Fortunately, you don't have to rely on organizations like the CIA in order to protect your identity Oh, this is online. a smooth transition to there. Yeah, sponge. Okay. Uh, let's see, where do we... Uh, I wonder what the burning ship... A uh, burning plane... Burning... Helicopter. Burning Chinook. Right? That's a Chinook. <clears throat> oh, man. This was a good fucking video. Holy shit. I, I wasn't expecting it to be this good. But that was really good. I think this is one of their best videos, man. I'm gonna be honest. I think I think this is one of their best. Um, the, anime, the art style that they went for, the animation was very crisp, clean. The information was concise, yet still in depth um they, 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 very clear like uh flow of information happened here oh i just lo i just loved it wow 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 this was good um i really don't know what else to say aside from it's good this is a good fucking video by armchair historian um 
And I think I think they conveyed the information just right to not like. Now, of course, it's hard to really talk about the early days of the war in Afghanistan uh, without really sounding, you know, pro-American, right? Because, you know, the facts are that America was kicking ass at the beginning of the war. There, there was no denying that. Um, America was swinging its big military dick around in Afghanistan. So, um, but I thought they did a really good job of you know, conveying the information as unbiased as possible. Now, of course, conveying, there's there's no real such thing as being unbiased because there's just bias in everything. Um, I, I think it's impossible to avoid bias, right? Because also when you're re re relaying information, your sources are going to be biased, right? Your sources are going to tell you certain things and whatnot, right? And so, you know, it's good to get a wide variety, but you know, to make content like this, you gotta, you can't do all the research in the world because otherwise you're never gonna make the video, right? So I think, I think they did a really good job doing their research here and uh, um, conveying the information that they researched. I think they did a wonderful job. Um, but uh, yeah, that is going to be the end of the video today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.